so uh, uh, and also i would like to thank for giving me this opportunity so i think post operative ph is a challenging and a feared complication of uh, any congenital heart disease surgery and the most severe manifestation that is generally known as pulmonary hypertensive crisis are the acute right heart syndrome where there is a right heart failure followed with uh, cardiovascular collapse this can be of three types only it can be a persistent ph or it can be a progressive ph or there can be a de novo ph that is happening in the post operative period like for example in tetralogy if you do a vsd there is a new onset ph that can happen a daunting it's a daunting therapeutic challenge there is no doubt about that it occurs sporadically in individual individual institutions so most of the times there is varied approach to the treatment and the most of the times it is not an evidence based treatment that we are following it is associated with a very high mortality so how common is uh, such a post operative ph some of the studies uh, in the 2000 published in 2002 a large series from a large center suggested it's around 2% of all cst surgeries possibly it may be encountered more in india because of delayed surgeries and all those stuffs but we don't have any data from india so what is the pathophysiology of uh, this, the worst complication that is the ph crisis so there is uh, classically evidence of uh, uh, rb hypocontractility elevation of uh, uh, ra pressure rb systolic dysfunction and shock the compensatory mechanisms fail and the rb systolic dysfunctions uh, the the function worsens and then there is a decompensation the lv preload actually decreases and then that that actually abolishes cardiac output and coronary perfusion so worsening hypoxemia and acidosis further uh, exaggerate this vicious cycle so ultimate cause of death is right heart failure and the right heart failure ability of the right heart to handle the added strain and the augmented pulmonary artery pressure is a critical thing we really don't know why some rvs fail while others are able to cope very well with a high pa pressure and the patients come up without a ph crisis we really don't know but uh, for the for the people who know understand physiology an acute ph rv cannot tolerate uh, or generate more than 40 mm hg in terms of pulmonary embolism and all so in terms of pathophysiology of ph crisis it's a, it's a more complex than just ph so the rv contractility rv ischemia elevation in rv edp uh, 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 that progressively in, uh, increases the lv edp that decreases the stroke volume and then that reduces the blood pressure and coronary blood flow ultimately leading to low cardiac output with lot of other uh, contributing factors like uh, starting from age dysfunctional endothelial cells sepsis cpb and so on and so forth there is not many things shall be coming to in detail so the the ones that, that are very important that we should all remember is uh, the presence of uh, preoperative pulmonary hypertension is one of the most uh, important uh, predisposing factors and the fluid status left ventricular systolic or diastolic heart failure and acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome pulmonary embolism acidosis and hypoxia are the most important ones that all clinicians should keep in mind so coming into which lesions produce this pulmonary arterial hypertension crisis so uh, this is a very old study but still it is relevant so some, surprisingly the, the some of the some of the uh, studies like some of the lesions like epc and tricuspid arteriosus are supposed to be associated with lot of uh, ph crisis but with the advent of uh, modern anesthesia and modern techniques i think uh, the numbers have come down uh, with the vsds and avsds uh, especially in pre existing ph are the ones that are mostly associated with uh, reversible ph now so what are the exact triggers for this kind of a ph crisis that develops so the exact triggers are not completely understood preoperative ph is a very very important characteristic and that there also like closing a vsd is likely to be associated with more likely to be associated with post operative ph than closing an asd uh, especially the crisis part and avsd is a much more common and then people who have down syndrome are more common to have ph crisis so the key key to the whole things are endothelial cell dysfunction both preoperatively and postoperatively an inflammatory response and ischemia reperfusion injury to cpb and even some simple pain and awakening reaction in mechanically ventilated children even tracheal sections and the tracheal secretions can actually trigger ph crisis so how do you evaluate and how do you manage a ph crisis or a severe ph in a postoperative situation so the three things that we want to look at is what are what is the effect on the whole hemodynamics so is there a systemic hypotension is there hypoxemia is there evidence of low cardiac output and tissue hypoxia that is number one number two is there any precipitating factors or aggravating factors removing which the things can be corrected like for example before you jump on to jump on the gun for specific therapies you rule out infection acidosis arrhythmia and pericardial effusion and then rule out other causes that could explain the symptoms of uh, thing rather than just the heart surgery like for example uh, pulmonary embolism or pneumothorax 
these are the major crux of evaluation that we should follow. And the gold standard is always uh, echocardiography, even though X-ray and ECG may help in ruling out some of the causes. But the gold standard is echocardiography. And oftentimes, we rely upon the tricuspid regurgitation, the pulmonary regurgitation velocities. Always as a clinician, we should remember that these can be falsely low in the presence of RV dysfunction and circulatory collapse. So that, that has, that's a big challenge. So TAPSI is out of all the other parameters of RV function. TAPSI may be quite useful, but it's not very well studied in this situation. So one important thing before, because which has a lot of meaningful information that gives a lot of meaningful information in terms of how do you manage the patient is RV and LV function. So both systolic and diastolic function and a critical look has to be made into the LA volumes and the RA volumes. IVC assessment is important as part of the fluid management and the amount of uh, right heart failure that is setting in. So always before we start treating the pulmonary artery hypertension, always look for structural causes depending on the surgery the patient has undergone. So some of the structural hazards one should not miss include in a patient who is suspected post-operative pH, it should be residual deviation like an apical VSDs or additional VSDs or a residual VSD that has been missed, a PDA or an AP window that has been missed or pulmonary vein narrowings that have unraveled post-surgically or that was missed here preoperatively, mitral valve lesions, the ventricular dysfunction that has set in. Always look for LSI here, as again I told you. Uh, the ventricular and the uh, AV valve hyperplasia, walked and arch issues. So always keep a checklist in your mind that always run through all of them, uh, chamber by chamber. And then never miss out an RUOTO that was earlier missed. And then that is actually causing the high velocity of TR, uh, peripheral PS, pulmonary embolism, lung causes. Even though, even though these are all unusual causes, they are very rare. But still, if you are in a very high volume center, once in a year, you will find all of them causing uh, what is so-called uh, residual pH in a uh, situation. For example, we we are we in a post-operative tetralogy, we realize we, we are dealing with some residual VSD or some pH crisis, but then we realize it's actually an acute AR that was actually producing uh, the whole issue and the patient underwent an AVR along with it and the patient uh, recovered finally. And then even arrhythmias also well known to increase pulmonary artery hypertension. And then post pontan and post glen present different issues which I will not be going into the details. Other evaluations could be BNP and anti pro BNP fluid status and vital organ function with uh, all your LFT, RFTs, CT angiogram if you are suspecting pulmonary embolism or peripheral PS or pulmonary vein issues or lung or airway issues are suspected, then CT angiography could be useful. Uh, VQ scan if you are suspecting pulmonary embolism and pulmonary artery catheter placing, it's a, it could be a useful thing. And same way, right heart catheterization can give a lot of information, but actually they are not evidence-based. We don't have evidence that such invasive monitoring helps in this kind of pH crisis. So how do you manage? So first and foremost thing is like just to look at uh, the TR velocity is high. Don't jump the gun and start Belrinone or start uh, uh, Sidenafil or uh, start put the patient on an NO ventilator. Always look for reversible causes, both structural and physiological. So always correct the structural causes if anything is found and then reverse and optimize the physiological status. If nothing works, then you consider specific therapies. And in mild to moderate pH, most of the time when they have a stable hemodynamics and preserved RV function, so optimizing, uh, ruling out structural issues and optimizing the physiological status may be good enough and considering simple therapies may work and then that could be good enough for managing. But the problem comes in pulmonary artery uh, uh, hypertension crisis where I think uh, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, things are going wrong. Unless we act fast, we may we miss the bus. So the basic goals of therapy are lowering the RV afterload, augmenting the RV preload and improving the RV contractility. So how do you do that? Most important things are the basic things, the boring things, the basic ones are more important in this situation than the fancy drugs. I think fluid status, it's a preload dependent situation. Both dehydration and overhydration are harmful. So you should try out boluses. And I always remember ventricular interdependence plays a very critical role in such critical patients who have uh, uh, <laughs> compromised RV. And in such a situation, uh, monitoring wedge pressures and monitoring right that catheterization could be of use. Correct acidosis, hypoxemia, and anemia. Uh, in terms of anemia, we don't know the optimal hemoglobin in this situation, but we all know that possibly less than 9 and greater than 18 in a cyanotic congenital heart disease are undesirable. So, in a patient who is not ventilated, uh, oxygen is a potent pulmonary vasodilator. <laughs> but in the absence of hypoxia, this role is not proven. Uh, and then in a patient with cyanotic congenital heart disease, target may be lower as we all know that. Uh, alkalinization has been proposed as a therapy for pH crisis, 
to give sodium bicarbonate to achieve a pH of 7.44, but it generally is useful in the presence of other ionotropic and vasopressor drugs are being given. And then uh, there are some reports suggest that prolonged alkalinization may actually be harmful in newborns and neonates. So sedation, generally anxiety and agitation increases the PDR and oxygen consumption, and it has to be done with caution. So anesthesia and ventilation plays a very, very critical role, and the, it has to be a tailored approach. One size doesn't fit everybody with pH crisis. So lower tidal volume and lung protective ventilation strategies are emerging. Just the treatment of choice. Normal ventilation with PCO2 uh, targeting around 35 to 40 are needed with long respiratory times. And if uh, necessary during a crisis period, manual ventilation back could be used. And increase in arterial to end tidal CO2 gradient indicates decrease in pulmonary blood flow. That could be a good marker to monitor. Manuals triggering pH crisis should be avoided. And nurses have to be told how to do a secretion in patients who are predisposed to pH crisis. So the important cornerstones of therapy are specific pulmonary vasodilator therapies and the various ionotropes and vasopressors. They are the two more cornerstones. Like adequate BP is paramount because preserved RV function, coronary flow is extremely important in this situation. Try to keep SBP more than pulmonary pressure if possible. Uh, but, but always remember that there's a, a reshifting of IVS from left to right side as an important goal in this uh, treatment. And we generally tend to use ionotropes to maintain a cardiac output of cardiac index of two liter per minute per meter square. But however, we should avoid overzealous use of presses because we always increase the RV after load and myocardial oxygen consumption. No single vasopressor has demonstrated superiority. Norepinephrine is generally considered treatment of choice in shock situations. How it, it seems it doesn't alter the PVR or the renal perfusion. Dopamine and epinephrine are also effective, but they increase the heart rate and myocardial oxygen consumption more than norepinephrine. Vasopressin, there are few case reports that suggest that it actually dilates pulmonary arteries. It's a good systemic vasopressor. We all know that. Mm. Agents that are generally considered to be more useful are the milrinone and amrinone. Uh, they are the, they uh, slow the metabolism of cyclic AMP, which we all know that, and then increases the cardiac contractility. They have lesser increase in heart rate and then augment stroke volume more and they reduce pulmonary arterial hypertension. So there are theoretical advantages, levosim and done. The calcium sensitizer that enhances contactility without increasing myocardial oxygen consumption. It is a potent pulmonary and systemic vasodilator. It has potent anti ischemic effects. And there are several case reports and no systemic studies are available. In the nutshell, the, the, uh, the guideline that uh, people referred to, the Pediatric Pulmonary Vascular Disease Network, suggests that uh, epinephrine uh, positive ionotropy increases myocardial oxygen consumption, modest effects on PVR and uh, SVR. Whereas vasopressin, telepressin, or doesn't have effect on PVR. Norepinephrine and dopamine have good effect on increases in SVR and PVR, whereas milrinone definitely lowers PVR, with the caution being systemic arterial hypertension, and levosimindan actually lowers PVR, caution again is systemic arterial hypertension. So in nutshell, the drugs that, uh, that are very useful will be vasopressin, telepressin, milrinone, and levosimindan. In dopamine, if, uh, if uh, 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 tachycardia can be uh, there. Coming on to prostacycline, anyway, they are not available in India, but then for completion's sake, that can be used. IV epoprostenol can be the preferred agent, but uh, some people now suggest that in this situation, inhaled ileoprost through the ventilator can be a more pulmonary specific therapy. Even actually epoprostenol has been used in inhalation form for this indication, because uh, otherwise IV may be associated with systemic blood pressure reduction. There are very few studies that uh, suggest that inhaled ileoprost can be effective. Uh, the RU function may improve. Uh, but uh, it's not available in India. So coming to the most commonly used drug and commonly most commonly misused drug, that is sildenafil, both in oral as well as IV form for this indication. It has a rapid anti uh, onset of action. It has potent vasodilatory effect and relatively pulmonary specificity is there. Uh, but uh, one interesting thought is that pre-surgical cephalactic use of sildenafil is uh, suggested to reduce the occurrence of pH crisis. IV sildenafil is useful but it's, uh, the effectiveness is only uh, demonstrated by few small studies, but systemic hypotension and impairment of oxygenization are the important ones. The, the studies are like limited. Uh, the, the studies suggest that possibly the time to extubation as well as time of to intensive care unit comes down with IV sildenafil in a small little patients of around 27 patients. Uh, coming to ERS, that is uh, endothelial receptor antagonist, there is hardly any evidence for its use in an acute period uh, situation. Uh, in the oral forms, uh, but still we use in some patients. Inhaled nitric oxide is for many considered as an agent of choice because of its potent 
pulmonary vascular elevation capacities, virtual absence of systemic effect because it is immediately inactivated by hemoglobin. Uh, it's able to improve oxygenation and then has a good safety margin. There are numerous case reports and small series that are available. So uh, some of the series suggested that 54% uh, 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 responded favorably with 20% drop in PVRI. But one of the most important problems that is associated seen with NHL nitric oxide is two-thirds of them develop a withdrawal syndrome or rebound uh, worsening when the uh, NO is uh, tapered off. So the, there are multiple studies that are available. So, so there are 210 studies. This is meta-analysis that says this is a difficult to draw valid conclusions given the concern regarding methodological quality. None of the studies are able to show a significant uh, difference in clinically important uh, parameters. They all have a modest effect on various parameters. So this is the effect on uh, mortality with INO in uh, pulmonary artery hypertension crisis. So some of them have tried the combination therapies with a more popular combination being a vasodilatory agent with an inhaled NO with an inotrope like a dobutamine or uh, sildenafil can be combined with in inhaled NO also. So these are the various uh, specific therapies that have been uh, advocated. IV epoprostinol, ileoprost inhaled, are uh, intravenous, uh, INO, sildenafil intravenous, and then oral. So these are the, uh, the final recommendation for any ICU-related pH. So oxygen, if there is hypoxia, intravenous prostonides, uh, and then INO, concomitant sildenafil. So look at it like only concomitant sildenafil used in for rebound INO is a class 1 indication. Rest of them are actually class 2B indication where uh, we have to use something, so we always use uh, things. Always remember, Number additional therapies help like bass and box and temporary mechanical separate support. A v a ECMO is often preferred even during uh, CPR. If it is instituted, it is it has a survival rate of around 38 percent. And then pumpless lung assist devices and lung and heart lung transplantation has to be found. One important thing is that if the patient makes through the pulmonary artery hypertension, residual pulmonary artery hypertension, it seems that on the long term follow up, some of the studies, the recent articles suggest that the long term follow up, the outcomes are relatively well preserved. So to conclude, it's a life-threatening emergency. It has to be treated aggressively since outcomes are poor. Actively look for structural causes, optimize the physiology. Don't treat by reflex, but as most of the treatment that we, have, we think that it works, there is no evidence to support. The inotropes and pulmonary vasodilators are the mainstay. The other support devices to be considered early when other strategies fail. So thank you for your kind attention.